is not only to derive in order the fundamental laws of nature, that's what kind of Jewish system they try to find with microscopic laws, better and better ways to understand the laws of which microscopic particles interact and find new particles, but also to try to understand what I call the sociology of those particles. How, you know, once you have the laws, how do you, when they have put many of them together, what kind of behavior do they show? What kind of collective behavior do they show? What forms of matter do they show? Do they become a metal? Do they become a solid? Do they become a superconductor? Things we'll hear about in, uh, in continuous of the talk. So this is a lot of relevance, and it's, I would say, as difficult as the problem of finding new particles and new interactions. So trying to understand how they act together and kind of what kind of phenomena we can get out of these. Of course, this has enormous technological relevance as well. You know, a lot of these materials we use in computers today, in sensors, we hope to use them in next generation works over quantum technologies where we try to make exploit these quantum mechanical effects, these enhanced materials to build better sensors, better clocks, we'll talk about that, maybe quantum computers and things like that. But the fundamental end, that's what my interest is, the interest of mine mainly is to try to really understand the underlying processes and really kind of build models which allow us to do this in a very unique way. Okay, so why, why is it so hard? Why can't we just calculate this with our best computers? When we have fantastic classical computers today, supercomputers, uh, costing, you know, a huge amount of money, so why can't we just put those, you know, calculate what kind of material properties we're going to get and let me explain what the problem is. So uh, imagine uh, what I call the ultimate hard drive, where you would store, like, within a single atom, you would code, code a bit to zero and one of information, and that would be just this atom, for example, this spin, as we have this arrow connected pointing upwards or downwards, okay, that's a property of the atom that the atom has, and now let's say all the atoms are in state zero, now all the atoms are in state one, or there's some information stored on your hard disk, so you course, want to some pattern of this information up and down, zero and one, so your hard drive, right? Okay, so that's the classical world, but in the quantum world, we have a kind of intriguing feature that the quantum system can not only be in this state, or that state, or that state, or that state, it can be simultaneously be in all of those states. And when we even just want to write down what the state is, the system is, we need two to the end, where n is the kind of number of particles that happen in my, my system, uh, configurations, and two to the end coefficients that I have to write down, just to describe the state, I haven't even done any calculation with that. So just to give you a fresh two to the end, it's going to be an enormous number, even if I just put 300 particles. 300 atoms is nothing compared to how many atoms we have in this piece of block of solid here, okay? So 300 atoms is absolutely nothing. But that's already a number which is as large as the number of photons we estimate to be in the entire universe today. So it's a gigantic number, okay? And that's, you haven't even done any, any calculation. And just to store those values, just to describe that state, is an incredibly complicated task. So this is a problem that even with our, you know, best computers that we have at hand, even for very small system sites, we run into this problem, we call this exponential increasing problem, that even if we want to add just one particle more, we want to calculate what the system does, when we go from 300 to 300 one particles, we have to double the capacity of our computer. Okay, every time we just add one more, we double. And that, of course, you can really see, makes you run into a tremendous problem. And that really does not allow you to calculate these problems in the full breadth on these supercomputers. And it's a fundamental problem. It's not a problem that we, you know, can solve in a few years. Better computers can do maybe go from 300 to 3 to 310 maybe, but, you know, that's not a huge advance in, in the problems. So here's, like, where this other line of thinking comes in, and where we're going to connect to Richard Feynman. And it builds on really fantastic experimental work over the past decades in trying to control the quantum world, control single particles at the ultimate limit of what quantum mechanics allows us to do. For example, single atoms and ions, photons, and two of the heroes, you know, who received the Nobel Prize for their work on that were Dave Weinland, Karen Boulder, and Sergio Walsh in Paris, for example, who really were one of the pioneers who gained these ultimate control. So the amazing thing was that Richard Feynman already foresaw in the 1980s that if you would have such fantastic control, if you would ever have such control over such single quantum objects, and at that time we didn't, nobody had that control, so it was really quite visionary, then you could build something, you know, build kind of a machine out of these, assemble out of these individual quantum objects, object the machine, a quantum simulator, he called it, some people call it a quantum computer today, to simulate the physics, the physics problem efficiently, without running into this huge problem, you know, of this memory capacity problem that we heard about. And now actually many groups are trying to solve this problem, trying to address this, so we'll, I'll tell you about our work of these atoms and crystals of light, there are people working with these ions, so charged atoms that are held in electromagnetic cages, and actually also here is a very successful group, uh, by, led by John Martinez here at UCSB, and Google Labs here in Santa Barbara, they're trying to build these machines with superconducting devices, okay? So that's the motivation. And now let me tell you how we do it, okay? How we kind of generate the systems and allow us to build these quantum simulators, and now let me turn to the story of what you call quantum gases. And this is another, almost like another separate story line, uh, that's fascinating as the first one, but we'll, as I promised you, we'll connect to at the end, which starts in 1924, 1925, when a young Indian physicist, Sakyana Raposa, sent his work on uh, black body radiation, a big problem at the time, to Albert Einstein, but Albert Einstein could translate the paper at that time, you know, most of the physics literature was published in German. So, you see, most of the famous uh, physics literature was published in German, and he asked Einstein for help, and Einstein helped him, but also immediately saw that really this Indian physicist had a tremendous uh, idea, and developed built on that idea, and uh, wrote down his own theory later on this quantum theory of the atomic ideal gas. So, probably that's not the most famous work you know from Einstein, uh, but it is actually a really important one, it's really important works in 1925, we'll talk about why, what's so radical in this, and why this is such a fantastic uh, paper that he wrote in 1925. And it took almost like uh, 70, 75 years more to, to realize this state of matter in its clear form, and uh, the heroes who did that in the end were Eric Connell, Carl Wyman, and Lord Canada, who shared the Nobel Prize for that in 2001. I'll explain exactly what I mean by that, what they actually did. Uh, and one thing I just want to show you, know, this is a lab book, except the both kinds of lab books. Uh, now we have an electronic, but at that time I also had my lab books in writing, and you see you have the time uh, when things kind of happen, and uh, so here's like uh, 554, uh, 559, and that's five blocks in the morning. Okay, so they measured the whole night. So and then you see at 604, 29 seconds, they see this BC exclamation mark, and that's what I want to tell you about. Actually, today I would also like to remember another hero who sadly passed away just two weeks ago, uh, Deborah Jen. She was uh, actually the one who tamed another kind of species brought them into the ultra-cold world, and she deserves to be on this list just as much as these three here. Uh, it's a tragic loss for our whole community, but what I want to kind of show you in the next uh, slide is why we are so proud of these four people, okay? So this deep actually touches people on how we perceive matter. And we talk about matter, what is matter? And here's a picture of most people would conceive matter, what one think about matter. So it's this microscope takes a block of material, this is actually solid particles on a copper surface, a picture taken with a scanning tunneling microscope, another Nobel Prize, but that yet we at the time. And uh, so what you see is a picture, okay, this is a sulfur atom, here's another sulfur atom, and they form this crystalline structure, and it looks like you have classical balls sitting there, particles, and they
I see the wave counter of these amplified waves in this kind of microscopic resonator. This violin, this small violin for these electron waves that he's building. And you can ask, you know, how large can the object become? I'm not, we I said, well, we, 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 the principle we're also waves, but our wavelength is so short that we can't perceive it. So how big can you go? And some of the biggest objects that people have been using today are done in experiments in the Google Science in Vienna. So he takes these big core football molecules, these so-called 64 football molecules, or even our insulin molecules, and can show that they show these interference effects as well. So even from really large kind of molecules, we can see this matter wave characteristic. Okay, now I want to come back to the story of Bose and Einstein and tell you another way how we can make this wave pattern very prominent. And uh, so let's think about the classical gas, the air around us. So we have nitrogen molecules, oxygen molecules, they all are pretty much pretty fast flying around us. And we know from De Broglie, we know what we have to do to make the wave pattern important. We know we have to make the velocity of the particles small to make the De Broglie wavelength very big. And velocity small means, in thermodynamics, means to cool down particles. Okay, so if you, thermal, if you think about what is thermal motion, what is temperature, temperature describes how fast particles move. And if you slow them down, if you cool them down, then you can dramatically enhance this De Broglie wavelength according to uh, what De Broglie has taught us. And now comes this famous prediction from Einstein and Bose into play, what he said, what they said, was that if this De Broglie wavelength becomes so large that it's comparable to the average spacing between the particles, then something magical happens, then suddenly all these waves lock together to form one kind of giant coherent matter wave. So in order to describe this, what this means, I always say it's like an orchestra where everybody, you know, in a classical gas, like the gas around us, everybody plays whatever he wants. Okay, so it's like total chaos. The flutes play what they want, the violins play what they want, and everybody. When you cool the orchestra down, you cool it down more, you freeze it down a bit more, and suddenly they all play the same tune. Okay, there's really one temperature below which you go, and suddenly they play the same tune, and they're all kind of now synchronously. That's what these matter waves do, and that was what Einstein and Bose predicted in 1924, basically achieving the ultimate control over matter at that point. Uh, so this is pretty much, if you compare it to light, it's pretty much this both Einstein condensate for matter is what the laser is for light. So if you think of a lot of classical light bulbs, you have light coming out of different frequencies, different colors, and all kinds of directions, total chaos. And the laser, we like a laser so much because laser emits light, which is this perfect continuous wave. It's a perfect wave, one beam of light, one frequency, one color, one direction, not like this light bulb, which emits all kinds of colors and all kinds of directions, so basically complete chaos. So if you want to think of it, think of this both Einstein condensate for matter, what the laser is for light. Okay, so that's, that's basically uh, what this BC is, and why we're so excited about it. Now there's one problem, uh, if I basically take this, this condition, the both Einstein condensation, where the, the broad wavelength has to be comparable to the spacing between the particles, it turns out when I do that, I just take the density of water and I calculate when is this condition met at what temperature, it turns out this is at 1 Kelvin, it's about 7 Fahrenheit, so that's in Celsius, so minus 541 or 42 something, am I right? Or, okay, I know it in Celsius, minus, just minus 272 degrees Celsius, and very close to absolute zero temperature, but the problem is that those temperatures, uh, water is not a cosine, I want to say, but those temperatures, water is just a block of ice, like what you have in your freezer, okay? So we have to devise new ideas, and this is what Eric Connell, Carl Ryman, and Bob McKenna uh, have the ingenious idea that basically if we can lower the density so that water or our gas cannot form this block of ice, but at the same time we can reach conditions for both Einstein condensation, we can achieve this new phase of matter that has been predicted. Density, it means we have to go to even lower temperatures. And now let me show you what we're facing from an experimental challenge where we actually have to go in the experiment. So this is temperature scale. This is this De Broglie wavelength I introduced to you. And uh, so these are kind of typical points. You know, water freezes here, the air liquefies, uh, 4 Kelvin. Here it liquefies minus 452 Fahrenheit, degree Fahrenheit. But we need to go 1 million times lower temperatures in our experiments to reach these conditions for both Einstein condensation. And simply there's no fridge in the world that can take us from here to 1 million times lower than there. Okay. So we have to develop new cooling techniques to cool the atoms. And whenever you cool things, you know, fantastic things happen. We know that in nature. We know, you know, you the gas can turn into a liquid, a liquid into a solid, a normal conductor can turn into a superconductor, we'll talk about these BCs in a second. Um, just to show you one of these magic properties of the superconductors, which is very related to the phenomenon of Bose-Einstein condensation that I'm going to tell you about now in a second, how we see that, uh, if you take such a superconductor, just to show you the beautiful physics you have, place it in a magnetic field, it just floats above this magnetic field. Okay, and what's happening is there's actually a current running in this superconductor, and it can run without friction. It's frictionless current that runs in the superconductor that creates a magnetic field that repels it from this magnetic field and keeps it floating like this. Here's another picture, beautiful picture of how that happens. So that's actually very similar to the physics that we're going to discuss here, what happens in these superconductors when you cool particles down and they form a Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay, so what is this radical idea? To cool to one million times lower than any other machine can do for us. And this is another great story in physics, uh, and actually is about radiation pressure, about cooling with light, okay? So now, usually cooling actually with laser light, as I'll tell you, and you might think I'm crazy because laser light, people associate totally different things, totally, you think welding, heating up things, blasting things, you know, but I'll tell you, you can cool with laser light super efficiently. And then you can cool with light, and that light exerts a macroscopic force onto uh, particles. You can actually also see in this in this picture of the comet, this is comet here, Bob, and uh, it has its dusty tail behind it, and what you find is that actually this tail of dust here usually points away from the sun. And the reason why it points away from the sun is because, uh, one reason is because it's like,